Hello and welcome to After the Oil Machine. The issues raised in the film The Oil Machine have become even more urgent in recent months with dramatic upheavals in energy security, the cost of living and our climate. A year on from the COP26 climate conference in Glasgow, we're going back to the film's contributors to ask them how recent global events have shaped the ongoing debate about oil. I'm Rachel Kaplan, Outreach Coordinator for the film, and I'm delighted to be joined here today by James Marriott. James is a writer, artist, activist, and co-author of Crude Britannia. He's a key participant and an executive producer of the film, The Oil Machine, and James is part of Platform, a London-based arts, activism, education, and research organization whose current campaigns focus on the social, economic, and environmental impacts of the global oil industry. Much has changed in the last few months, and a big new development is the war in Ukraine and our growing energy bills. And against this backdrop, the UK government is rushing to put out over 100 new licenses for North Sea oil and gas exploration. And our new energy secretary has said, Britain must get every cubic inch of gas out of the North Sea. Is this going to make a difference to our energy security? Very good question. The answer is no, neither on the long term nor in the immediate short term either. This is not the solution to the problems that we face over energy. The solution to those is essentially to deal with this on energy needs through wind and solar and also through extensive energy reduction through insulation and so on. We can see how the British policy, politics, economics, and culture indeed is swayed still by oil. That's the, the driving um, narrative and the driving story in Crew Britannia. We've, we tried to explain how British economy and politics and culture was made by, by oil or was driven by oil since the Second World War. And you can see that acutely in the last period, both in terms of how the global energy crisis, the increase in the cost of energy, particularly oil and gas, has been driven by war uh, in Ukraine, and that impacts on the UK. And you can see that impacting not only in the cost of living crisis, the, the price that people have to pay for their own heating and, and electricity and so on, but also in the political turmoil. All the crisis that we've seen in the, the way the British government has been in the last month particularly, much of that is driven by the energy price rise and, and the attempt by the government to try and find a solution to that. What I find interesting about it is that the driving intent over time is to, is to try and rein in oil and gas production in the North Sea. And there were steps towards doing that being considered at a government level, certainly in the Scottish government in the period running up to and shortly after the COP26 in Glasgow. That has been turned absolutely on its head by the war. And all of those forces that wanted to pursue drilling, that wanted to, uh, to, to push for further licenses to be issued, they gained the upper hand. And those forces are fundamentally the forces of capital, investors, and the forces of the state in terms of the British government who wanted to push forward for these licenses, mainly for a political advantage, mainly for the performance of saying, we, Britain, will get our own energy from our own resources, which when you look into it in detail, in detail is absolutely nonsense, but it, makes, it can make for good political theatre. What do these new licenses mean for you and uh, the work that you do with Platform and that you've been doing with oil workers towards a just transition? Well, what they do is they, they make it, to some extent, more complicated or at least more drawn out. We've been working together with my colleagues, we've been working hard to consider how is it that we can move away from oil and gas without mm -hmm. that impacting on either the workers who work in the offshore, but crucially also the communities that, that they live in and depend mm -hmm. upon um, offshore production and on uh, offshore engineering and so on and so forth. Um, in this country, you know, we have a, a bad history of transitions having huge impacts on workers and communities. We saw that in the closing of the coal mines, but you also saw it in other areas of closure, such as closing of uh, petrochemicals plants in South Wales 
or closing of petrochemicals plants in near Manchester and so on over over the period in the in the 90, 80s and 90s and into the 2000s. And we don't want to repeat that as we push for moving away from oil and gas production as fast as possible in the North Sea. So that's why we have to work together with workers, offshore workers, to help them get rid of the barriers to them moving out of oil and gas work and into other work, which might be renewables, but might also be other forms of activity which, which need and use their engineering skills. We've seen some very dramatic stunts by climate protesters in recent months, uh, Just Stop Oil and others. And um, often the infrastructure, the oil machine is targeted. Um, do, can these Are these actions helping to move things forward or are there other ways that we can be working together? I, I think we need any means. We need many, many, many different means of making this mm. shift. It, it requires a whole spectrum act of activities, whether that's direct action protest people climbing on uh, the bridge, Dartford Bridge, which is to try and disrupt the flow of traffic on the M25, or people locking onto uh, oil tankers. R from that, right over to the process of working patiently and carefully with oil workers to say, okay, how can the work that you've done and the and the the, and the, uh, the, the vouchers and the and, and the, the level skill levels that you have certified in oil be allowed to translate carefully and neatly into wind without an extra cost to you. That's detailed, careful policy work. And that ha that's the kind of thing that has to be done as well as people uh, locking onto, onto, onto oil tankers or even taking action against um, the uh, pictures in the National Gallery. The, the current government, large chunks of the current government are in this country are definitely staking themselves as being against what might be called the green agenda and, and for the agenda of trying to extract more and oil, more oil and gas, um, both onshore and offshore. And that has to be fought. And I admire and support those people who are going out on the streets and taking action to protest against that. I find it, I think it's deeply concerning what the new Home Secretary is proposing in terms of uh, strength of, of giving more powers to the state and the police to clamp down on um, those who are protesting, those who are trying to demonstrate on matters to do with climate, and also those people who are in trade unions trying to defend their livelihoods and their pay and their conditions of work. Uh, it, it is con deeply concerning to me that. Um, I not sure it will succeed. I think that people are very committed to these issues and they will take, uh, um, they will be powerful and determined in their resistance on these matters, particularly climate, because it's not going to go away, it's going to get worse. Um, uh, but what I find interesting is that you see again and again a pattern of questions around energy. And after all, Just Stop Oil is, isn't saying plant trees, it says just stop oil. It's a campaign about energy. And you see again and again cl clashes between the, those people who are trying to address questions of energy and the state resisting them and eroding public liberties in, in the process. I was reading last week that the government are actually considering um, bringing in a windfall tax on wind and solar companies. Do you think that's something we should be doing? It's a good question. I think the, the, we should primarily be focused on windfall taxes on the key areas of profit making, which is um, the oil and gas companies. We have to recognise that the oil and gas majors who operate in the North, UK North Sea, they are enormous global concerns. They are uh, companies which have of which the UK, although they might say, for example, BP produces 9% of the UK's offshore oil and gas, but the, but as a proportion of BP itself, the, the production that it has within the UK is tiny, absolutely tiny. It produces more oil and gas than, say, Senegal or Mauritania and Azerbaijan than it does in the UK. And mm -hmm. I say that to illustrate the fact that for, 
for, for a company such as BP to take a large windfall tax, it can do so with very little impact on its overall profitability. Mm -hmm. Whereas t to tax a, an, a wind company which is largely working in the UK, although not necessarily exclusively, uh, or a solar company which is largely working in the UK and not, not necessarily exclusively, that will have a much bigger impact on those companies and may dent their ability to be able to invest in projects in the UK. It seems we're in this crucial moment right now. In the film, Sir David King says, um, I believe that what we do over the next five years will determine the future of humanity for the next millennium. So what key changes need to take place in the UK right now to stop this window of opportunity being squandered? I mean, I, I, I think to David's um, comment in the film is extremely sobering. Uh, you know, every time I look at it, I, I can't get away from... And the weight and gravitas in which he speaks is, is very powerful, very, very um, moving, I find. We have to do everything. We have basically have to do everything. I think the, the, the fundamental uh, thing we need to do is to move it to being the center of our daily activity. In a, in a, in a war situation, say, for example, the war in the Ukraine, you know, few, few people who are living in that can be considering anything else. It's their everyday reality. And they're constantly trying to navigate what, how to deal with that everyday reality. And that was the same in, in, in this country during the Second World War. And it seems to me that we need to apply the same attitude towards climate. So to consider climate in every action we do, and that's not just simply reducing, say, for example, the, our use of plastic bags or whatever, but consider it in terms of how can we put pressure on the government? How can we put pressure on our colleagues? How can we put pressure on our family? How can we put pressure on the people, our neighbors? How can we change? How do I relate to climate change? How do I adapt to climate change in my immediate neighborhood here? That's a very difficult question for me to answer. But I seem to, I think that I need to place it centrally in my mind and keep coming back to it. Just as, you know, how do we push the government? How do we, uh, how do we uh, change things in our families? We need to have that central question come back to it again and again and again and again and again. And only by having it in that place in our hearts and our minds will we address it because it's not an easy challenge and it has to be addressed. To wrap up, James, uh, as you are the executive producer of The Oil Machine, what sets this film apart from other films about oil? I think the thing that's very striking to me about it is that it considers the, as much as it can, the, the entirety of the oil machine. There's a tendency to think that oil is something that happens just at a place where you're pumping it out of the ground on an oil rig. Or perhaps oil is something that you're concerned about as you put it into your petrol tank in the car. What the film illustrates clearly is that oil is there within, say, for example, finance or politics or culture or indeed in every part of our daily life. And I think for me to be able to portray that, to portray the fact that we live within an oil machine, that it's all around us, it impacts on every part of our lives. That is a powerful thing to do. It's a hard thing to do because you're trying to make something which is essentially pretty invisible to render that visible, particularly finance. How do you render finance visible? The other thing about the film is that it tries to look at the question from all angles. It represents both school strikers and oil rig workers. It represents both people in finance and people, senior executives in oil companies. It, it represents both people in um, who are deeply involved in criticism of the government and corporations in terms of uh, climate change and also economists who have thought about this. And I think that sense of the, the breadth of it and trying to give each of those different perspective some space in which to express themselves 
um, and allow the viewer to make their judgment of whether they feel sympathetic towards one character or another character, whether they believe that they, that character is being honest or or, 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 or not. Um, I think that's a, that's a very rare thing that the film does because there's a tendency films to come down on one side or the other. Um, and okay, that's fine. That's, that's all, all different films have different functions, but I think this film's ability to have a breadth of perspectives is a particularly unique thing. Definitely. Thank you, James Marriott, for joining us today. The Oil Machine is now showing in cinemas across the UK, and you can also contact us about hosting a community screening for your organisation, business or group, wherever you are. Find out more at theoilmachine.org. <laughs>